Hello. With this video, we're going to start a lecture series on introduction to database or database systems. The material that I'm going to present is based upon lectures that I've delivered to college and university students over the years. As I deliver these lectures or compile these videos for presentation in this fashion, I'm going to follow a similar approach to the delivery me method that I took in presenting courses to these students. So this section is going to serve to set the context and provide basic database concepts and definition. The topic is general motivation. Why study database? Why is database relevant? Why should I be interested in database? Well, databases have become a central component of business operations, a sort of sine qua non. So that's kind of the idea of what's motivating us to give you this series of lectures. So what are we going to cover in this particular section? Well, you can kind of review what we have here. I'm going to build a foundation for understanding and working with da a database system. We're going to introduce key terms and definitions of database terminology. And I want to caution you here that there are many, many terms. So it's very important to recognize that as we're talking about database systems, you have to learn a new vocabulary. And sometimes my students have found this to be one of the most challenging aspects of learning database, is learning this new set of terminology. What I hope to do is to introduce various terms as we go along and continually reuse those or apply those terms in further discussions. That's why we need to understand the terms, but hopefully by going through that process of repeated exposure to the terms, it'll help you become acquainted and comfortable with the terminology. And again, many students have commented in uh, classes that I've delivered about being overwhelmed by the terminology. We're also going to take a look at a couple different approaches to storing data, what we'll call data persistence. We can use traditional file processing where we're using operating system file services, and we'll compare and contrast that with a database approach, looking at advantages, perhaps disadvantages of either, uh, uh, say, either method. We'll also introduce something called a three schema architecture, which is extremely important to grasp in terms of acquiring an understanding of what databases do and an appreciation of certain very interesting qualities such as data independence, for example. So we'll explain what that is and its relevance to the database environment. We'll also talk about different data management approaches. We'll talk about something called operational or transactional databases. And we'll also talk about kind of an informational data management approach, which you might see with data warehousing or data marts or using a flashy term common today, big data. So we'll kind of give you a feel for the different ways that database technology might come into play. Along the way, as we pre present our overview here or a discussion of what is a database, why it's relevant and so forth, we'll also acquaint you with job functions or roles of individuals who might work within an organization and are involved with databases in some way. Individuals who design the databases, individuals who actually kind of build or implement the databases, people who might simply be designated as users of the databases, and those who are administering the database, database administrators. So we'll talk about some of that as we go along. Additional objectives for this section would be to acquaint students with the broad spectrum of database applications and how database organizations are using these database applications for competitive advantage. We'll describe data models and how they are used to capture the nature and relationships that exist among data. And we'll further describe the major components of a database system and how these components interact with each other. It sounds like we're talking about everything related to database, but keep in mind, this is the big picture. And what we'll do is in future lectures, we'll take some of these topics and kind of drill down and expand upon them in much more detail. This is intended as simply an overview or introduction to database to kind of get you excited about it. Probably if you're watching the video, you're already excited about it, so don't need to watch the video. 
well, h h hang in there. Just entertain me and, and, and watch it nonetheless. OK, here we go. So what is a database system? Seems like the logical first question to ask. So we can say a database system can be thought of as an electronic filing system. And if you think about a filing cabinet, what you have is you have an organized collection of related data. What you have is data pertaining to one kind of individual or one entity would be stored in a file folder. And then the file folders are arranged in such a way that they would be easily accessible. So they might be arranged alphabetically, having some kind of labels on them. And then we could very easily do what we'll call efficient retrieval. We can put the file folder into the cabinet, and subsequently, when a need arises to find a particular file folder, data that describes a particular individual, we could retrieve that very easily. We would not have to go through every single folder in there to find the particular folder that's of interest to us. So that means we can also retrieve a subset of the data, a subset of the contents of the file cabinet. We could also retrieve the folder, make some modifications to its content, maybe add additional data, alter some of the data that's in there. And the same applies to working with data entrusted to a database system. We could modify the data that it is holding for us. We can also remove data when it's no longer needed. For example, if we had a file folder about some individual and that individual was no longer relevant to our organization, then we could remove the folder for that individual and it would no longer be stored in the cabinet. Similar concept applies to data entrusted to the database. Now, one other important point is that when you put the data within a file cabinet, at some point, it's probably going to have to be secured. That is, the file cabinet would have to be locked to prevent unauthorized access to the content of the cabinet and of any folder. Similar concept applies to the data that we store in a database. There is some kind of security capability or mechanism within the system. So databases themselves can be of various sizes and complexity. And what we see is that a simple database, say of contact information, which you might have on a cell phone, may be quite small in terms of the storage actually required. And this is typically what we might call a personalized database intended for a single user or maybe stored on a, like a local area network. So it's intended for a small user community, a small number of users. But large corporations kind of moving in the other direction may have databases that consist of several megabytes, gigabytes, even terabytes. Megabytes being millions of bytes, gigabytes being billions, terabytes being trillions of bytes of data. So such data will often reside on a single mainframe computer, or it may span multiple nodes on some kind of a distributed system. There might be a local area network where we have one or more machines designated as the server, kind of the file cabinet, to hold the data. So such databases could be of the variety of what we're calling operational, or they could be, you know, using another name, transactional meaning that data kind of reflects current events, current activities. And again, we'll elaborate on that as we go along. We could also have another type of database, very large decision support systems, DSS, may be implemented as a data warehouse, a data mart, and these may contain gigabytes, terabytes. They may even go up to things like petabytes of data where we're talking about quadrillions of bytes of data. That's pretty big. Sometimes I have trouble just grasping the concept of a thousand or a million. But when you start to talk about quadrillions, I, I can't really grasp that. OK, let's move on. So we've talked about what is a database. Well, what is a database management system? Another term that comes up. Well, a database management system is noted as a DBMS. It's a software system that enables the use of a database approach to storing and managing data. So a DBMS might be perceived as a computer program, but very often it's a compilation or a collection of various programs, where each program unit has a specialized role that it plays or specialized task that it performs within this system. 
the database itself serves as an interface between applications and the data that we've entrusted. Normally, if we were to write a program, for example, we write a program, it might be in C or COBOL, or Java, whatever, and that program goes out to the operating system and accesses some data. As it accesses the data, it's in a sense directly communicating and directly affecting the content of the operating system file. But when we write a program that works with a database, the database program has to talk to the DBMS, and the DBMS then works with the data on disk, retrieves that data if the request was a query or a read operation. It might massage or manipulate the data in some way or do some screening of the data based upon authorization and then return some result back to the application. So the point is the DBMS kind of sits between what we'll call the front end or application program and the back end or database. And it is kind of coordinating all of the activity between the program requesting data or manipulating data in some way and the database which actually stores the data. So there's an extra software layer. Remember the database management system is software. It's a program or a collection of programs. So you have your program, you have the operating system, and another layer of software in between. The front end need not be a program. And this is what's really exciting, that you don't have to know how to program in some programming language in order to use a database. We can go down another route. The other route would be Let's say we're looking at interactive query processing. And by that, what I mean is I simply want to ask a question of the database. I don't need to know how to program in COBOL, C, Java, whatever the language might be. I simply need to know how to use the interactive tool. Sometimes the tool is graphical in nature. It's a GUI. Sometimes it's kind of a, a textual based tool. You type in commands. So in that case, you may need to know a special language called SQL if you're using a relational database. SQL stands for the Structured Query Language. But SQL is not that difficult to learn, and we have a series of videos on that, and we'll talk about it as we go through this lecture series. So with an interactive tool, the user could be a business manager, could be some executive who doesn't even have an IT background, and that individual can submit requests from the tool to the DBMS, the same way the program did, and then the DBMS again says, well, let's go get the data that, that this is going to be needed, get the data, again, maybe massage it in some way, and then return a result to the user. So the flow is essentially the same, but the two individuals working with the database can be distinctly different in terms of what kind of functions or operations they perform within the organization and also with respect to the skill set that they have or knowledge of computer technology or database technology. That's pretty exciting. So what we're looking at is we could have somebody which might be an application developer who writes the program code to make calls to the database. Then users can run that program. Alternatively, users may be able to connect to the database directly using some kind of an interactive front-end tool and don't have to work with the application programs or programming language. So the DBMS is, again, a layer in between that does quite a bit for us. So the database approach to managing data overcomes the limitations of historically what we use quite frequently, a file processing approach. And we'll have more to say on that shortly. But the database approach begins with the proper design of the database. So we're talking about the database down here, almost looking at it as though it's kind of just a black box. Just down here we say database. But that database has some kind of structure or organization to it. That is, it has been designed in some way in terms of organizing the content and expressing and capturing relationships between different types of things represented within the database. So 
someone has to design this. And what they do is they identify in what's called the problem domain or the application domain, the real world that we wish to somehow represent within our database. They have to understand that real world and identify what are called entities, relationships, attributes. And from that problem domain or application domain, they then construct a representation or model of the real world. That model will then translate into the way our database is actually structured or represented. And again, we would define that structure to the DBMS, and the DBMS then becomes responsible for maintaining the content of that database and respecting relationships, which is something called data integrity. So the individuals who would do this would be called perhaps database designers. They might be called data modelers, or they could be called data architects. Okay, so those are some of the things to be aware of in terms of the environment. Let's move ahead. What are the responsibilities of a DBMS? What, what, what do I mean by that? Well, let's go back here. We've got a program that can't talk directly to the data. We've got an interactive tool which gives us flexibility, but it cannot directly access the data. Both the interactive tool and the program are pieces of software. The DBMS is another piece of software, an additional layer. So when we think about it, the DBMS is coordinating all the activity, all communication or access to the data, but it's adding overhead because there's another software component, another program running on the system. So when we talk about DBMS responsibility, two ways of viewing this. We could say, well, what does the DBMS actually do? Kind of like, I want to justify your existence. I, I bought you, I'm working with you, but what are you doing? I'm giving you a paycheck. What am I getting in return? Kind of a return on investment. What does the DBMS do for us? So it's kind of just justifying its existence in that regard. But we also said by having the DBMS, it's kind of disallowing us from directly accessing and working with the data. So what is the DBMS doing then that makes that reasonable for us as well? Here's a brief list of what the DBMS does, say in terms of responsibilities or operations it performs. I think it's worth taking a, a look at these things, but these are topics that we'll address in more detail later on. We talk about security. Well, the database can be accessed by many different users. Some databases might be accessed by uh, a dozen users, dozens of users, hundreds of users, potentially thousands of users. So what happens is when we're accessing the database, there's a lot of data in there. And some of the data might be considered sensitive or confidential or private in nature. So what the database management system has to do is it has to ensure that any user who is communicating with the system is indeed permitted to do what they're requesting to do with the data, like they're trying to add a new record or update an existing record or just look at data, just read some data. Well, are they indeed authorized to do that? So what we talk about with security is a concept of kind of users being known to the system and users being authorized to perform operations. And here we see that the database management system will ensure that only those folks who are authorized to perform certain operations are actually permitted to do those operations and we, we will uh, accompany them in the process of doing it. So therefore, security by itself might be enough to satisfy you in terms of, oh, the DBMS justifies itself. I'm very important, I'm very concerned about that. Security is important. But another thing is what's called data integrity. We talk about enforcing business rules. Well, what is a business rule? A simple business rule might be expressed in terms of a relationship. We talk about things like employees, and then we talk about other things like departments. And we recognize that in the real world, there's an association or relationship that may exist between these two different types of things. What we'll see is that an employee is assigned to a department. Well, there's a rule associated with this. It might be mandatory that an employee must be assigned to exactly one department. That is, we just can't have an employee walking the hallways and say, well, 
uh, who's your boss? What's your, what's your department? And they say, well, I, I don't have one, but, you, but they're getting a paycheck. So there might be a requirement uh, that they participate in this relationship. That's a business rule. Another business rule might be something like when we record information about an employee, kind of create a brand new record to reflect the existence or the recording of data about that individual in our database, our representation of the real world, what we see is, well, uh, employee has a first name, last name, date of birth, date of hire, and so on. Maybe some of those are optional, some are required. Does every employee have to have a first name and a last name? Possible not. I actually did some consulting for an organization where they explained to me a problem that the way their database had been designed, the database said, oh, employee must have a first name, employee must have a last name, and turned out the particular individual uh, that ran into some problem with the system had only a single name. Call it first or last, but they had only one name. But the system required to record data about this individual that they provide both a first and last name. That's a, a, a bit of a challenge. Okay, so what happens is the fact that a name might be required or name might be optional is a business rule. So that's kind of interesting stuff to think about. We define that type of integrity to the database system, and the database ensures that those rules are followed when we add new data or update data within the database. Concurrency. We have mentioned that databases are often used by many people. What happens is the database management system needs some kind of traffic cop, if you will, someone standing in the middle of an intersection and controlling the flow of the traffic through that intersection. Effectively, when we talk about concurrency control, it's how the database management system addresses the idea of multiple users interacting with the database, perhaps even the same data at the same time. It's going to be done in an organized and predictable fashion. So the DBMS provides that. Consistency. Consistency refers to the concept of transaction support, where we're making modifications to data. This ties back to perhaps some aspect of the uh, integrity and the business rule. So we're talking about the idea that we're making modifications to the data, and then when the data uh, has been modified appropriately, appropriately and we've completed all of those changes, then and only then will the data be stored within the database and made available or exposed to other users. The idea is with consistency, we ensure that no user who is looking at the data sees data that might be considered tentative or kind of in, in a state of flux or change. Whatever they see is always considered the fact of record that is stored in the database. This is a true statement. Uh, and we don't have to worry about, well, this could be the way it is uh, because you're seeing something as it's in a state of change. There's a concept uh, with a term often called dirty data. The dirty data would be data that's in the state of change. If you were to look at that, you could be basing decisions on something that really is has not been committed or made permanent in the database, and you could be making some false assumptions. So consistency says when we make modifications, the data is brought from this consistent state to another consistent state, but never exposed to other users as it's in this state of flux or transition. And finally, because the database management system is software and the data, our database, is stored out on some hardware, some disk, there's always the possibility that something can go wrong. For example, the power fluctuation could occur where uh, the transaction is interrupted in some way. There could be a hardware failure on the storage device and so on. So we need some mechanism to deal with situations where there's some kind of a problem that arises, some kind of a failure, and we need to be able to recover from that failure. So modern database management systems have a variety of recovery capabilities built into them. And this is also a topic we'll talk about later in our series of courses. So pretty exciting stuff, but hopefully uh, you're getting a, a good feel for what's going on here. Okay, so why do we want to study database? Well, here's the big motivating factor as I see it. 
<clears throat> the concept here of data persistence. What we see is that as you're working with data, doesn't matter whether you're dealing with a database, if you're working with data in a computer, what happens is the data is going to be manipulated in some way in the main memory of the computer. You're making changes to the data, maybe creating new a rec record, maybe modifying fields of an existing record, but you're making modifications. What happens, say, if you were working with a word processor or a spreadsheet and suddenly the machine had kind of like a, a hiccup? That is, there was a power surge or something, and your program terminated abruptly, or the machine rebooted. Well, anything you were working on was in main memory. Therefore, whatever was in main memory is lost, because that memory is transient or temporary in nature. It's volatile memory. So it is subject to change, and if you power off the machine or exit a program, the content of main memory is effectively lost. So the data that you were manipulating would not by itself survive the execution of the program that was working with it. So you need some way to take that data and have it survive the execution of the program that brought it into existence or was manipulating it in some way. This is the concept of data persistence. Data persistence can be achieved in a couple of ways. It can be achieved by using operating system files. So if you have a spreadsheet, that's stored in some kind of a file. If you have a word processing document, that's stored in some kind of a file. We can do likewise when storing data about things like employees, departments, students, classes, courses, faculty, and whatever. But we also have an alternative, and that's the focus of the course, and also we'll draw a, a comparison between files and this alternative. The alternative is a database system. So both are mechanisms for achieving data persistence. So we're going to consider how file systems and databases might be similar in ways, but also how they're different, and what are the benefits and advantages of either mechanism for file persistence. So before we go on with all of that, we've been talking about data persistence, but we have not yet defined what do we mean by data. That might be a good term to define here. So data, first off, could be classified in different ways. Data could be structured, data could be unstructured, data could be semi-structured. So let's take a look at this. Data itself could be considered stored representations of meaningful objects and events. The first thing to recognize here is that we understand some micro world, some application domain, some problem domain. That's the real world of interest to us. See, when you build a database, you don't look at say, well, I'm going to represent the entire world, the entire universe, but you're going to pick some subset of that. Very often it's some minute subset of that. Suppose, for example, I was in a typical organization. The organization might have something like a payroll department. It might have an accounts payable department. If it's manufacturing, there might be various departments within the manufacturing aspect of the organization out on the shop floor, whatever they do. And it also is going to have like an HR or human resource department. Depending upon what the needs are, I may develop a database that represents the entire organization. That would be pretty big. That would constitute my application domain. That the entire application domain would be the entire organization. But I could pick one of those departments. And suppose I needed to build some kind of a database system to store data for human resources and only human resources. Then obviously, I'm not even concerned with what the product is that's being manufactured. I'm not really concerned with accounts payable and so forth. I'm very focused, very localized. So my application domain then has boundaries. The boundaries then determine what exists in the real world that is of interest or relevance to it. What we then do is we produce a representation of that, a data model. That representation then gets translated into our database. Now we're going to talk about that in great detail later on. So when we talk about stored representation of meaningful objects and events, that pertains to whatever the application domain or problem domain might be.
those are the things. So for human resource, we might have representation of employee. We might have representation of department. We might have representation of division and so forth. Whatever entities or objects are relevant to that domain. And the events might be representing the hiring of an employee, the promoting of an employee, those things that might be under the control or jurisdiction of the HR department. So that's data. So data then could be considered not just as stored representations, but simply raw facts. Okay, the fact that we have an employee and the employee's name is Tim, last name is Hartley, date of birth is this, date of hire is this, and so forth. Those are just facts. We'll look at how to work with that in a little bit, just a couple slides. Now, the type of data that we have could be structured, unstructured, or semi-structured. By structured, we mean that the data is stored, uh, say, in databases. That's known as structured data because there's some format that dictates its organization. So, say, each record in a relational database table, we have not really talked about that yet, but each record in a relational database table follows the same format as the other records. They all have the same structure. So that would mean going back to HR and employees, every employee has an attribute or column to store first name, to store last name, to store date of birth, to store date of hire, and so on. And each column is of a particular data type. Some of the columns are numbers, some are character strings, and some are date time values. With unstructured data, what we might look at is we say there's very limited indication of the type of data. Here, if we're dealing with multimedia, such as images, videos, and documents, this might fall into that category. We also have the concept of semi-structured. <coughs> Excuse me, with semi-structured, we have something called a schema. We talk about schema information. What is schema information? Schema information, well, let's put it this way. As we talk about schema, we're kind of going back to the format. So schema information is related to the concept of defining what the structure might be. So with structured data, as we were talking about something like a database table, what we see is the structure is kind of predefined and we simply deposit the data values. But when we talk about semi-structured, there's an interesting thing that happens. What we see is the schema information may not be stored external to the data, but it's mixed with the data itself. So we have something that says, oh, this is such and such, and then following that would be, here are the values. The schema information is going to be introduced commonly by something like a tag, and what follows that would be a value. Now, pause and think for a moment. If you've worked with computer technology, have you come across things like that? Well, if you've worked with XML, XML could fall into this category of semi-structured. It contains within an XML, XML document a description of the schema, effectively, a description of the content together with the actual data value, the actual meaningful content to a user of the system. So that's pretty neat. So the data is sometimes referred to, as we note here, as self-describing. So that's a quick taste on these different categories of data. Hopefully that's not overwhelming. Uh, and if it is, take a, take a breath, pause, because there are a lot more terms coming down the road in just a moment. Now we mentioned that the data could be considered just raw facts. But to make use of the data, it has to be interpreted and processed and applied in some context. So we have concepts of what would be called something like business intelligence. With business intelligence, we're talking about a process of obtaining information about a business or organization from the data. So we take the raw facts or unprocessed facts or raw data and somehow add meaning and hence add value to that. These facts are examined and interpreted and they can guide the behavior or the direction of the business. 
So that means we should probably come up with a definition of this term called information. Well, information provides a better understanding of the business. Analysts will then take the data and then say, well, based on this context, this is what this means. We could answer business type of questions. See, data, simple data questions in terms of day-to-day -day operations like what was ordered yesterday and what was shipped, that's simply raw data. Which accounts are more than 30 days outstanding, that's just raw data. But what we can do by looking at some of this data, by saying, well, you know, how many orders came in yesterday, how many orders were shipped, we can kind of get an idea of how we're responding to the order and take, take a look at the order processing. And maybe there's something wrong internally in the way the business is operating. It's not, not shipping out the orders fast enough. Or maybe this is great, we're, we're right on target, we're keeping up with the demand of the users and getting the product delivered to them very quickly and efficiently. So the idea is that's what information is about, looking at the data, interpreting it, and applying it to decision making. So pretty, pretty good stuff, pretty important stuff. So the data that we were talking about, those raw facts, a couple of examples at the bottom of what, what was uh, ordered, what was shipped, for example, that data comes during business transactions through the operation of a system called an operational data store or a transactional database. Many business intelligence questions require not just what's going on right now, current data, but they require historical data. And the idea of the historical data says that, well, we've captured data for today's activities, yesterday's activities, and it goes back and we've captured data for last week, last month. So we have all of this data reflecting not just a small window, the current window, but a wide, broad window of activity or time. And what happens is that type of data is where we really do the real decision making and apply business intelligence to it. Typically, this is stored in what's called a data warehouse, perhaps something on a smaller scale called a data mart. But the historical nature of data allows us as business analysts to do what's called time-based analysis. So we can do time-based analysis where we can look at, well, what happened this hour, that hour, and some other hour, or it can be further back. We can say, well, what happened yesterday? What happened last week? And we can look at how things are going. This also gives rise to the concept of trend analysis so that we can see if the behavior of what we're currently doing is consistent with the behavior a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. And if for that reason, this historical data can be quite large. We're accumulating massive quantities of data in order to be able to conduct this type of time-based and trend analysis. So typically what you'll see is within an organization, data warehouse or historical data is going to be maintained by different people and structured and organized in a different way than the data for an operational database. So the people who design the transactional database data modelers might come up with what are called traditional entity relationship diagrams. The people who design data warehouses might take a different approach. There are things where they talk about special ways of structuring the data, such as what's called a star schema or snowflake schema. So the point is it could be a different skill set that's required, even though both individuals might be designing databases, they're designing different kinds of databases for different types of workloads or activities, but they're still doing database design data modeling. So the nature of the questions that might be asked to serve as business intelligence analysis might be more general than simply looking at the specific facts, the raw details that are out there. For example, someone might ask the question, how is my business performing? Well, you can't just put that in as a query and ask the database, how am I doing? Uh, you have to somehow interpret what that means and look at various ways of making an assessment 
for milestones and, and various accomplishments and so forth. What factors are influencing my business? Where is my business headed? And where should we focus our efforts? So very often the business analysis process involves much more interaction with the database by carrying on a dialogue where you're drilling down. You kind of get the big picture and then you drill into something that kind of catches your attention to look for more uh, in information about it. And the point is that th this process is not the same as simply writing a query against an ad hoc or say an ad hoc query against an operational data store. Okay, that's quite a bit. So again, at this point, I w wouldn't be alarmed uh, at all if you feel the need to take, take a quick break and then come back and look at more. This is a rather lengthy uh, presentation. I don't necessarily dump all of this information at one sitting on students who attend my, my college and university classes. It's broken up into smaller segments. But what I'm doing here is I'm compiling a single video that corresponds to a topic and then leaving it up to you as a viewer of this to make a determination when you might need a break and pause. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind as you're going through this. Here's another definition for you. Schema or database schema. A database schema refers to the names of the attributes, the relationships, and classes or object types that exist within the system. Those things that are effectively characteristics of the real world that we're representing within our database. In essence, what it comes down to, a schema is a description of the data. Kind of have a feel for that already from what we've stated previously. Now, there's another interesting point to be made here. The schema defines the structure or description of our containers, how the data will be organized, how different things might be related to one another. But there's also the concept here of actually storing data within the database. So when we define the structure, we've effectively built an empty house. It's not until we interact with that structure and populate the tables in some way that we're actually putting data into the database and creating what is referred to as a database state. So the state is kind of looking at what is currently stored, what are the current values of these attributes and things of that sort versus the schema is talking about what does this thing look like in terms of looking at it from the perspective of a building that is to be constructed or that has been constructed. This is kind of looking at who's currently residing in the building, what, what, what's living there. So when we get the initial state of the database, what happens is the schema is created, but there's nothing in there. We populate it by doing some kind of a load of data from outside the database, perhaps using a database utility. Or we could do it interactively where users are running applications or using a front end tool to perform operations that cause data to be inserted into the database. The database state is often subject to change because we don't just have a certain content in the database and that's it, it will never change, but it's subject to change, especially in an operational data store, because we're doing insert, update, delete operations, what are called data manipulation or DML operations. So we're constantly altering the content of the database, hence affecting the state. On the other hand, the schema is much more static. In some instances, the schema will never change but it's possible that the schema will change. And when it changes, this is a process referred to as schema evolution. And with relational database, it's going to be fairly similar between the commercial products that are based on what's called the relational model, commercial products that are considered relational database systems. It will be very similar as to how schema evolution can occur. One final definition for this section. Well, metadata. When you define a database, you're specifying what kind of data, that is character data, numeric data, date time data, that's referred to as a data type. You're defining the structures. When we talk about 
a table as a way of storing data in a relational database, or at least logically perceiving uh, the table as the structure. We talk about rows and columns, and we talk about the names of those columns, as well as the data types, perhaps the sizes of the columns, that could be a type of constraint, and then also capturing relationships and other aspects of, say, data integrity. When we talk about all of those things, that type of stuff, that type of information, that type of data must be preserved within the database in some way. Because the database management system, in order to say, well, you just gave me a number, but the field is a character, it has to know the data type. Or you just gave me something for the name of an individual, but you gave me far too many characters. How does it know that? When the tables are described to the system through what are called data definition statements, what happens is we define what the attributes are by name, by size, by data type. We also define the constraints, and the system preserves that information somewhere. Typically, you and I, as users of the system, don't care too much about that particular data because it's used by the system to control operations. But that data is a special kind of data referred to as metadata. It is data in the database that describes other things, describes other data, data that describes data. So, for example, if I tell you I'm storing information about employees in a table called employee, and the employee table has a character column for first name, character column for last name, it has a date column for higher date, and so forth, that is all information that's necessary to define the table to the database, but also necessary for the DBMS to validate operations. That's metadata. Turns out that the metadata is something that we can interact with if we wish. We can view structures of tables, but most of the time it's something used by the database. The metadata is stored in something typically referred to as the system catalog. It's a special repository that maintains or retains all of this information and is used almost exclusively by the DBMS itself. Very important concept when working with database. So the concept of metadata will come up in other contexts if you're designing database as well. But typically, if you're working with a DBMS, you don't really care so much about the metadata, but if it was not there, you, you would care about it because the system wouldn't be able to validate your operations. So the next thing we look at is finally getting to the point where we're comparing and contrasting two methods of achieving data persistence, operating system files and databases. A file, we can say, is simply a collection of data items. On the other hand, a database is a collection of data items, plus it captures relationships between these items. That's the big distinction between a simple file system and a database system. Now, there are different models, or what they call data models, for describing databases in terms of the logical structure, but also in terms of how users will interact with those structures. There's what's called the network model, a hierarchic model, a relational model, object-oriented model. These are different ways, in a sense, of looking at the data. Most of what we'll be talking about throughout this course will be the relational model. So at some point, we'll talk formally about the theory behind relational database, but we'll be talking about relational products. And we'll have a case study that shows you specifically what users see when working with a relational product. Now, these models differ in how the data would be stored and organized and accessed. They also differ in the manner in which the relationships are captured within the system. But all these different database perspectives or models serve to capture relationships. Doesn't matter what flavor you're looking at, network, hierarchical, relational, or object-oriented, they all capture relationships. That's the distinguishing feature between a database and a file. Now, let's take a closer look here. 
what we have is an example of a couple of files that might come from some kind of an insurance application. We have a file called the policy master file, and we have a claim file. I know this is not the most exciting area to talk about, insurance, but it serves to illustrate our, our, our con concepts that we want to get across here. So the policy master file would have one record within the file that identifies each policy issued by the company. So it has a policy number as a unique identifier, perhaps the name of the policy holder, the address, the premium amount, and the dot, dot, dot suggests there's a whole bunch of other stuff here that describes one record within the policy master file. We also have a claim file. If you have insurance and you have a policy, undoubtedly at some point you're going to have to file a claim against the policy. So you'll have a claim number and you'll have to somehow relate your claim to your policy. And then the name of the individual who's filing the claim, the amount of the claim, and again, a whole bunch of other stuff might exist there. Now, if we use this simple approach of two files, we'll store policy data in one record in the policy master file, and we'll store information about the claim in one record in the claim file. So using these simple, simple operating system files, the question arises as to how a particular claim is considered to be related to a particular policy. Well, what we're looking at at the moment, a couple of fields in each record. And as we look at one of the fields here, what we see is there is a field called policy number that exists within the claim file. That might have caught your eye if you looked at these descriptions, and you would say, well, that clearly must be the way that a record in the claim file is related to a record in the policy file. Well, perhaps it is. More than likely, that is the case. However, when you're looking at simple file systems, what you'll find is it's not going to be confirmed to you just by looking at the names of the data items as to what that data item actually is. Very often, historically, the data type or the data item names were very short, curt, kind of cryptic, and did not necessarily convey the meaning of what was in there. If you, if you were been around for a while, you might have uh, rec remembered or, or maybe you heard by reading some ancient history book that file names at one time were limited to eight characters and file types or extensions to three characters. So the file names were very brief and did not necessarily convey the meaning of what was in the file. Similar restrictions existed over the years in terms of the length of data item names or field names. So very often these names were short and cryptic and again may have suggested something but may have been misinterpreted uh, if you simply look at the name. So keep that in mind that we are making an assumption here when we look at these files. Hopefully there's some external documentation that would help us. So when a policy uh, and a claim are defined to a database system. The relationship that exists between a record that is policy and a record that is claim, that relationship is made explicit to the system. That's part of the metadata that's captured. You define two separate containers and then you say how those containers are connected or related. That's another form of metadata. The system retains that information. So that's recorded in the system catalog, and this is how the system can then ensure that the data we put in for a claim is going to be valid and refer to a legitimate or real policy. For example, if we recognize that the claim file is going to contain claim information, and we populate it by giving some claim number, some policy number, and so forth, if we're dealing with a straight file system, we could perhaps put anything we want within the policy number because there's nothing that forces the policy number entered in the claim file to match the policy number of some record within the policy master file. Perhaps some logic encoded within an application will enforce that, but that's kind of a procedural type of integrity, and it relies upon whoever wrote the program to do the checking or the validation. If someone writes a brand new program that processes only the claim file, 
There's nothing to prevent them from putting whatever they want in here as a policy number, even if there's no corresponding policy number value in the policy master file. So the database operates in a very different way. It guarantees that if you tell me your claim data and your policy data are related, there's a reference here, then when you put a policy number into your claim data, the system said, I'm going to make sure there is a policy with that number. Otherwise, I'm not going to accept your claim data. That's one aspect of what's called data integrity. That is a critical point of any database management system. Now, another concept that we discuss here is what is called data composition. In a general sense, a database is a collection of related data and has the following implicit properties. The database represents some aspect of the real world. The database consists of a logically coherent collection with some inherent meaning. That is, we are capturing data or representing data in some way about things in the real world that are related. And what we're looking at here is these relationships are somehow represented within our database. So our model is what our database is. Our, the database is a model of the real world. So it has to assume all of the same characteristics of the real world counterparts and it has to exhibit similar behavior when we interact with it. And that's an aspect of integrity. So the database is designed for some specific purpose, typically intended for some particularly targeted audience uh, of users who have some kind of preconceived application, what they're going to do with the data once they get it into the system. So with databases, there are different sizes and complexities of databases, depending on the what we call the application domain or problem domain. And we've discussed that point already. Uh, but the idea about the different sizes, if you're in manufacturing, uh, the complexity might be much more significant than human resources. Scientific or engineering uh, might be mu much more complex than manufacturing even. Financial, the data might make a lot of sense to some financial analysts, but the business rules that are required to be understood and then captured and represented within the database, they might be complex and require a, a bit of effort on the part of who's ever doing the modeling of the database or designing the database to comprehend all of those aspects of the business. So anyway, the nature of the databases that you've captured, they can vary quite a bit. Now, the DBMS software has to be able to work equally well with any number of database applications. Uh, for example, a university database, a banking database, uh, some kind of company database. As long as the database definition is stored within the catalog, the application domain or problem domain should not be an issue. It's the challenge to design the database, but the DBMS, such as Oracle, or DB2, or SQL Server, any of these commercial relational products, can handle those application domains. The effort comes from the database designer to capture all of the characteristics of the real world in the model that he or she is developing, and then to implement that within the database system. The major distinguishing characteristic of a database is the notion of capturing relationships. In our definition of file versus our definition of database, that was the distinguishing part of the definition. Relationships have different cardinality. The cardinality says, well, if we're talking about what's called a binary relationship, we have two things that are related. For example, an employee is one thing, a department is another. An employee is assigned to a department. So that's what's called a binary relationship. A student, another type of entity. A class, another type of entity. There's a binary relationship there. Two things are connected. A student registers for a class. When we talk about cardinality, we're talking about, well, how many of this thing, like how many employees, participate in the assigned to relationship? And how many of the other thing, the department, participate in that relationship? 
So we could say it's one to one, one to many, many to many. That's the notion of cardinality, in particular with respect to what's called a binary relationship. We'll expand and elaborate on this in later lectures when we start talking about data modeling or database design. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on this in just a moment. Now, the world itself tends to be rather complex. And when we try to model the world and represent it within the computer in the form of a database, then our model is naturally going to be complex. So what we have is we have illustrations as a way to kind of confirm our understanding as a database designer of the real world. Remember a moment ago, I talked about, suppose we had a financial application. Well, I'm not a financial analyst. There's a lot to deal with finance and say bonds and CDs and all that neat stuff uh, that I don't really have a grasp of. So if I was going to create a database to store that kind of data, I'll have to talk to someone who's considered a domain expert. Our problem domain or application domain being finance, I'll have to talk to someone who's very knowledgeable about finance and get an understanding and definition of the terms and the concept. And that individual could help me understand things like the cardinality, identify what relationships are there, and identify the cardinality, the number of instances of each type of thing that participate in the relationship. So how do we communicate? Well, if the domain expert simply starts talking in whatever jargon they have, I'm not going to understand it. So what I have to do is I have to try to absorb it and then have a way of kind of taking notes and then bringing this back to the domain expert and saying, did I get it right? Do, do I have a firm understanding of what you're saying? Is this what you said? The common way to do this, especially for an operational data store, is to create what's called an entity relationship diagram or an ER diagram or ER model. And this is going to describe what those things are that are related, how they're related, and it will also indicate things like the cardinality. How many of each thing participate? When we talk about the relationships between different types of things and the cardinalities, that's part of what is referred to as data semantics, kind of grasping a meaning of the data. What does it mean for an employee to be assigned to a department? The idea of an employee being assigned to a department conveys some kind of meaning, gives some kind of idea to someone who's familiar with, say, human resources. We want to be able to understand what that meaning is. And we furthermore want to be able to understand cardinalities of relationships because that's an extended part of the data semantics. Those are part of the business rules. So the meaning of the data, the meaning of the relationships. So in terms of relationships, what we have, things like a employee and parking space. This is considered one-to-one. -one. One employee is assigned to one parking space. We can always read it from the other direction as well. So here we could say one parking space is assigned to one employee. So that's a one-to-one. -one. Now, on the other hand, we can talk about one-to-many. One product line contains many products. What you're seeing over here in terms of the figures are components that would be included within an ER diagram or an entity relationship diagram. The boxes are the entities or the objects that are of interest to us, the things that we were talking about, employee, parking space, product line, product. And the line as drawn here is one notational mechanism for describing an association or a relationship. It's connecting the two different types of things. And then we put some kind of a name on the relationship. So an employee is assigned to a parking space. Down here, we show a slight difference in the cardinality. This particular mechanism here is what's called a crow's foot notation. Notice if it kind of looks like a crow's foot, uh, you've got the foot coming out with some toes protruding. Well, that's kind of what you have here. This signifies a cardinality of many. So what you have is where it's just a single line, sometimes there's a hash mark here. Uh, what you'll see is that's the one, and over here it's the many. So one product line contains many products, and that's the explanation here. The third cardinality that we mentioned is many to many, and here we go. 
a given student will register for many courses, a given course will have many students to register for it. If we read it directly as the diagram suggests, we could read it as many students register for many courses. But note the way I chose to describe it. We can talk about it from the instance of a single or particular student. If we've got Mo, Larry, and Curly as students out there, Mo may register for many different courses. Larry may register for many different courses. Curly may register for many different courses. Then, looking at it from the perspective of course and reading it in the other direction, for a given course, such as Introduction to Database, there will be many students who register. So, for the Introduction to Database, I might be fortunate enough to have attending the class Mo, Larry, and Curly. So, all three of them have registered. But looking at it from the perspective of an individual instance of the entity type, we tend to read it a little differently. Keep that in mind. It's a good thing to remember, but we'll reinforce that idea when we formally introduce the concept of entity relationship models and diagrams. Kind of a transition in what we're talking about now. Fortunately, not a lot of new terms coming up, but concepts. And this is where you can kind of put your feet back and relax for a moment. We're talking about the evolution of database technology. Effectively, we're asking the question of what motivated the development of database systems? Kind of where did database systems come from? So as we look at this, what we're considering is we're going to, say, attempt to understand something. So it's helpful when you do that to trace back to how we got to the current point of where we are at the moment and how it brought up this thing that we're trying to understand into existence or fashion. That's the objective of this particular section. So what we're going to do is in the next slide, we're going to explain what motivated the development of database systems. So computers were first used in the 1940s. So many of you who are viewing this are probably saying, well, that's a long, long, long time ago. But in the grand scheme of things, that's not all that long ago. If you think about how long uh, wagons have been around, for example, how long simple uh, kind of wheels and gears have been around and been in use, that's much, much longer than something like the computer. So relatively speaking, the computer is actually quite young. It has not been around for a long time. Database systems have been used since the 1960s, and those were on large single mainframe computers. So notice it took a couple decades, and then database systems started to come around. In the late 70s and early 80s, the use of database systems grew significantly. They became very popular and much more plentiful in terms of their availability choices for organizations in terms of which DBMS to use. And in fact, talking about things like relational database, if you've heard of Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, relational products first hit the marketplace in the early to mid 1980s. So they have not been around that long. And notice how long it's been since computers came out before we finally got to relational database, which is one of the current paradigms uh, that's being uh, used. So the database systems are relatively young, but they've evolved very quickly. So we're going to take a look at how this evolution transpired. So here we see, I'm calling this ancient history. Back in the good old days, people wrote programs in machine language or assembler language. That was the language to work with. They operated on data files if they needed persistent data. The description of the data, what the records look like, what the file looked like, that those descriptions were embedded within the program. That means that if the program was going to operate on different data, it had to modify information about its data description. Or if the data structure or organization changed, if you added another data item, then the whole program had to be modified to adapt to that change in the data because the data description changed and there was a strong dependence upon the application program for that particular organization or description of data. Furthermore, very low level, we had IO macros macros, which meant that the assembler language program actually had to communicate on a very low level with the operating system to say how to open the file, how to read the file, how to write to the file, how to get data uh, in and out of the file, but also how to close the file. 
So it was very, uh, very interesting how it was done, but not very uh, friendly in terms of what you might be accustomed to today. So as time went on, operating systems came about. And you would say, well, there weren't always operating systems? Well, here we're looking at some very simple operating systems, but notice the burden shifted a bit. This is one of the things you want to get out of this particular uh, explanation here. The application program might still be strongly dependent on the structure and organization of the data by having the data description embedded, but the I.O. operations, the input-output operations to read and write, they were now such that they were at a high level and they translated to commands issued to the operating system, and it was only the operating system that needed to be concerned with the low-level I.O. communication with the physical storage device, whether it be magnetic tape uh, or some kind of uh, magnetic disk or something of that sort. So there was a shift in responsibility which made writing the program quite a bit easier. Then we come up to more or less the modern world where we're looking at database management systems. Now, as we had said, the DBMS is an additional layer of software that resides between the file and the application. Technically, we could say it's another piece of software running on a machine that must communicate with the operating system in order to communicate with physical devices, but it also is going to communicate with the application program. So now, here's what you really want to see. Notice the definition of the data file it's no longer present within the application. The application program now, in essence, is immune to changes in the physical structure and organization of the data. This is a critical concept here called data independence. So the application program would not necessarily have to be modified if the physical structure or organization of the data stored out on secondary storage was modified in some way. That's neat. That's the concept of data independence. The DBMS doesn't itself have the exact structure, but what happens is that structure is somehow preserved as part of the metadata. So the files that contain the database data, those files are defined to the database management system, and information about those files, their name, location, the organization, the access method, and so forth, all of that is part of the metadata that exists within the system catalog. So now that information is stored external to the application program and in a, in a sense stored external to the DBMS, but accessible to the DBMS. So when a user issues a find operation or a get or a select whatever it might be to communicate with the DBMS that says, hey, I want to get some data, the request goes to the DBMS. The DBMS says, okay, let me figure out how to get that data. It looks at the file where the data would reside, figures out how to do it, issues a request to the operating system. The operating system does the low-level input-output operation to access the file, brings the data into its buffers. That data is then given to the DBMS. The DBMS manipulates it if necessary and finally presents a result back to the user. Now, with all of that, you might say, well, wow. Using a, a database management system, it's going to take an eternity to answer a question. Well, as the database software technology has evolved, so too has the hardware. And this all happens very, very quickly. It's impressive with how quickly it's done. Furthermore, DBMS vendors like Oracle and IBM and Microsoft put great effort into tweaking their database management system software to make it perform efficiently. And those are all issues that we'll bring to your attention in considerable more detail as we continue with uh, the, the, the course and go through these, uh, these uh, discussions. So what were the driving factors, perhaps, that contributed to the database technology or the evolution of the database technology? We identify four such factors here. The need for program data independence. That's a critical point, and we've addressed that already to some degree. What does it do? It reduces maintenance of the application. Remember, we said if you have an operating system file and you have a description within your application program, and the record structure changes, you've added a field or moved something around, well, the application now has to be updated because it has that definition tightly woven into the program. 
it is strongly dependent on the physical structure or the physical definition of the data. So if the data structure changes, the program changes. Program maintenance is very expensive from the standpoint of what companies have to pay for IT support. So if we could eliminate that additional maintenance cost, that's great. That means we could change the data, move it around in some way, and that would not have any adverse effect on an application program or on the economics of maintaining the application program. That's what data independence is all about. So we greatly reduced the cost of applications or maintaining the applications. Another objective was a desire to manage more complex data types and structures. And what we're seeing is there are very interesting data types that are present within database systems. We'll talk about some of these as we go along. And if you're really curious, uh, you, you can be very patient and wait. Eventually, I'll be posting lectures on an object-oriented database management system course that I did. I used to deliver that at the graduate level. I'm now doing it at undergraduate level as well. Uh, but that would give you much more insight to how extensible data types have come into play within database management systems. So at some point in the future, I'll be posting lectures on that topic because uh, I, I think people can benefit from that. Uh, also, another objective would be ease of data access, less, uh, less technical personnel, say fewer technical people are required uh, to uh, maintain the environment. Uh, need for more uh, powerful uh, decision support platforms. And one of the selling points in particular of relational database is that little diagram that I showed you very early on, where we have the DBMS as a software layer sitting between the front end and the database being the back end. The front end could be an application program or the front end could be an interactive type of query tool, which means that now people without any IT education or really uh, IT training can now easily interact on their own with the data and ask business questions, complex, sophisticated questions uh, because of the nature of such front end tools. So it seems as though these objectives uh, do suggest why we have gone to database, but also from what I've delivered to you so far, you can see, well, it seems like these objectives have clearly been met because I've been hitting upon a number of these points as we've gone along. Now, relational database systems are in widespread use today. Uh, so you've got products like Oracle Database, IBM DB2, Microsoft SQL Server, Sybase SQL Server, Informix, Microsoft Access, MySQL, and there are others. That's uh, a rather long list right there. These products all provide a capability to interact with them using a rather easy to learn query language called SQL. And again, we'll talk about that later on. And I've already posted a number of video videos of, on, that, on that topic uh, on uh, my channel. Okay, quick look at the evolution, kind of on a timeline. We started with operating system files, flat files. That's way, way back. And then you go along, and you see that those are kind of phasing out. We still have some around as what are called legacy systems. We're supporting them. But we're really not developing too much in the terms of operating system files as the means of data persistence. Hierarchical database. IBM had a mainframe database called IMS DL1, DL1 being the data language to work with it. And that was prevalent back in this time period, all the way up to today where it's still in use. Uh, in fact, I have experience working with this. Uh, so I, I actually had firsthand experience understanding how that works. I also had some exposure to a network database. Network is a slightly different model than hierarchic, but again, you can see there's some overlap in terms of the time period. Uh, when it was kind of prominent. And again, uh, th this is something that was used on mainframes. Uh, the product that I worked with was from a, a company called Colonet or Colonane. Uh, it was called IDMS. Relational products, I've worked with several of these. And actually, the timeline, I actually started back here when DB2 first came out. Back around 1984, I worked on some of the first releases of DB2. A little bit later down the road, I started working with Oracle and still further started working with SQL Server and MySQL. And you can see that this is no longer legacy. These things are 
in uh, current use. They're kind of in vogue. What we see is object-oriented and object-relational. I've worked with both of these. As I said, I've taught courses uh, in the area. And with object-relational, it turns out Oracle is actually a hybrid database, as is DB2, in that they support relational functionality, but they also support object orientation. So in that sense, it's object-relational. It's not pure object-oriented. But other systems, such as Versant, uh, Poet, Object Store, those were considered pure relational databases. I've had some dealings with those as well. And we can talk about that down the road in other lectures, perhaps other courses. And then getting into uh, data warehousing and so forth, you can see that this is much more recent on the timeline, uh, but that stuff is not legacy, that is current. Now, let's look at the data models. Now, this data model does not mean that what we're talking about is the designing a database, an entity relationship model, but the data model talks about the logical organization of data. Unfortunately, you're often going to see a particular term used multiple ways. There are multiple definitions associated with it. Data model is one of those. So later on, when we talk about designing a database, we'll talk about developing a data model. That would be an entity relationship model. Here, we're talking generically about the logical presentation of the data to users of a particular DBMS. So we have different ways of looking at the data. We have hierarchic, we have network, we have relational. Those each have their own kind of data model. Certain characteristics that define the structure or organization from a logical perspective, and also the access and manipulation of the data. What kind of operators are available to work on the data? How do you access the data? In a hierarchical model, hierarchical model, effectively what you have is a tree. The relationships are captured by pointers. So if you're familiar with having taken a data structures course, in main memory you might have created something like a linked list. You might have also implemented a binary tree. Well, this is not a binary tree, but this type of a structure is actually a tree where we have a parent and a child relationship, and then we can have a subsequent parent and child, hence going into grandchildren and so forth. We can also have not just one parent and uh, one child, but we can have one parent and it can be many children. For example, a department may sponsor many courses. At the same level of course in the hierarchy, a department may have assigned many faculty members, a department may have many students who major in it, and all of a sudden it's becoming kind of a broad or bushy tree. So that's the notion of hierarchy. There's a parent-child relationship, which is always implied to have the cardinality of one to many. A given department will have many courses. A given course is associated with exactly one department. As you follow the pointers to go from the parent to the child, you are said to be accessing a node in the hierarchy by navigating through the tree structure. Each time you go and follow a pointer, you will obtain one instance of whatever it is you're reaching here. So when I go from department to course, I will get a single course by following a pointer. I follow another pointer, I will get another course or another class. I'm always gonna get one of these things. Therefore, we characterize the processing as record level processing. An example of a commercial product that falls into this is IBM's IMS DL1. The network model is a little bit different. Instead of a strict parent-child relationship, we can implement something that has multiple parents. So a class is associated with a course and a class is associated with a faculty. A class could be an offering of a course. A class is taught by or instructed by a faculty member. So there can be multiple parents within a relationship. These associations, such as the course and class together, the faculty and class together, in network terminology, these are called sets and the elements within there, like faculty and class or course and class, they are referred to as set members. So that's how relationships might be defined or discussed within a network model. The relationships are again one to many. A given course has as offerings many classes. A class is an offering of one course. A given faculty member teaches many classes. A class is taught by one faculty member. So the child, in a sense, can have more than one parent. We again navigate by following pointers through the network. And each time we follow a pointer, we'll get one record, record level processing. 
example of a commercial product is once again Colonet's IDMS. Finally, we get to the relational model. With the relational model, uh, we talk about tables as being the logical structure. The table has rows and columns. Here we have a table called department, another table called course. I kind of left some of it un unlabeled, but each column has a name. Here we have DEPT, here we have CNO and DEPT. These other columns I've not given names to, which is focusing on a couple points here. How are relationships captured? Relationships are not captured by pointers, but they're captured by data values. Here, DEPT would be what is referred to as the primary key. Notice that within this table, there are three rows. We have CIS, a row for management, a row for philosophy. So within a department table, each row is uniquely identified by the value that appears within the DEPT column of that row. This is the identifier or the primary key. Over here, course has a primary key called CNO. C11 is a unique identifier, C22, P11. No two courses have the same course number. CNO is the primary key. But the relationship that we were talking about, how is that captured? What we're going to see here is that the relationship is captured through a column, which in this example coincidentally has the same name as the primary key in the other table. Don't count on that happening. It could, it could not. But the point is the value in this one will match the value over here. So I have somebody in CIS. There better be a CIS row over here. If there's not, this is a violation of what's called referential integrity. Then I've got someone in philosophy. And there, again, there better be philosophy over here. So the idea is the value that's inserted in what is called the foreign key has to match the value of the primary key value of some row over in what's called the parent table. We often call this a parent to child relationship. So again, we can capture a one to many relationship between our two tables. One of the biggest differences here is when you run a query and you've written a query to say, get me the courses, you don't get one course. If you're condition that you specify in your request identifies a dozen courses, you'll get all one dozen, you'll get all 12 course rows coming back at once. This is referred to as set level processing. This is a very interesting and important distinguishing characteristic between relational database and other database systems. Commercial products, well I could have filled the screen I guess, but what I chose to do is just give you a handful. IBM's DB2, Oracle Database, SQL Server, MySQL are common examples. So what do these look like logically? Like if we're talking about kind of a, a chart or a topology of what these things might look like, here's some quick little diagrams just to give you a taste. What we have is for our hierarchic database, what we, what we uh, have is uh, this hierarchy here where you've got a parent and it can have multiple children and each child could have multiple children. It's a tree structure. Network is a bit different because notice that what you've got is some children could have more than one parent. That is, they could be members in more than one set member kind of association. That's the difference. Moving ahead to relational, what do we see? Relationships are captured again in a different way. We've given you a taste of that. There's also what might be considered an object-oriented model. This is something that's kind of out there if you look at pure object oriented. There's a special group called uh, ODMG, the Object Data Management Group, which dictates uh, characteristics of the standard and so forth. We're not really going to talk about that in this particular series of lectures, but later on when I post my object oriented uh, database uh, lectures, we'll, we'll talk about it a bit. Uh, but anyway, there's another aspect here. Here you have different object types or classes and they're associated. And if you've done object-oriented programming in languages like Java or C++ or Eiffel or C Sharp, then you've got a grasp uh, of that concept. And then we talk about in data warehouse where we have decision support, you can have something that might be called a star schema. I briefly mentioned that this could exist. Uh, here, what we're simply saying is it's a different way of kind of characterizing the data and the relationships or associations. So in the middle, you see kind of 
uh, emanating out from the middle what you've got it's you've got a line to this dimension to this dimension to this dimension drawn more eloquently here this could actually be perceived as a star all these things are kind of radiating out from the center of the star and we have what are called facts and dimensions and we may talk a bit more about that later on but anyway that's uh, another aspect and then big data where they start talking about uh, no predefined data model well they're talking about things like what you have is uh, a, a no sql database well not quite as, as, as great or simple as it might sound but anyway there is another kind of paradigm uh, or philosophy for dealing with data and again time permitting we may get down to that somewhere down the road now, as we talk about database, we're talking about hardware capacity and processor speed have both increased significantly over the years. So too has the demand to preserve more data. You got a bigger, uh, you got a bigger garage, you're gonna put more things in. Well, that's what we're talking about here, units of measure. We talk about things like kilobytes, abbreviated as KB. When we talk about a kilobyte, that's roughly a thousand bytes. So if I got 4K of data or 4 kilobyte of data, I've got about 4,000 bytes of data. Then we talk about megabytes, MB, where a megabyte is about a million bytes. Gigabyte, about a billion. Terabyte, about a trillion. And then we start to go through the roof when we start to talk about petabytes and exabytes. And it goes on and on and on. Not so much with data persistence, but if you start talking about networking, you're, you're going to see about the volume of data there. And they talk, start talking about other things beyond quintillions, which is massive. Uh, but do people have such things? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, think about transactions at Walmart. You go into Walmart, you, you buy a couple things, you scan, and you look around, are all the other registers idle? No, the registers in the same store you're working at, there are people there making purchases, and there are people behind you that are ready to make purchases, and that's at one Walmart. How many Walmarts are there? And then you consider that they're recording, capturing all of that information, all of that, I'll say all of that data for the transaction. It doesn't take long to get up to gigabytes, terabytes, and start to look at things like petabytes and beyond. And you look at banking applications. I did, did some work uh, for large uh, international banks, and uh, the volume of data they deal with is just un unbelievable. Uh, so when you start dealing with this, these numbers of kilobyte, megabyte, nobody really talks about that. Uh, gigabyte, maybe they'll talk about it, but they're really starting to talk way on the upper end. Okay, let's look at some what I'll call considerations for using a database, what might be considered advantages and disadvantages of database. And again, we'll kind of do some uh, comparing and contrasting uh, with file systems as we go through this section. As we note here, a database is seen in a different way by different people within an organization. The three schema architecture helps us to explain these differences. See, the perception and understanding of a database depends on the job function and responsibility of the individual. So individual users and application programmers, as we note up toward the top of our three schema architecture, tend to work with only a small portion of the entire database. These people look at the database from the perspective of the business data captured by the database. So what they see is something that's kind of logical in nature. They're not seeing how things are actually represented with the nuts and bolts of a computer system. They're really looking at the data from a business perspective. And again, they tend to work with a small portion of the database. So they see subsets of the database, only that data relevant to what is going to address the specific needs for their specific purposes. So for example, there might be one portion of the overall database that applies to, say, human resources uh, for job hiring, for example. There might be another portion that applies to, say, the uh, shipping and receiving clerk, and that individual uh, may see things for shipments coming in, 
they may see a different view that uh, that says something about the finished product that's been produced within the organization, how that gets sent out. Again, little subsets, little pockets of, of data with little functionality within the organization. So these are referred to as local views. And again, they are logical in nature. Systems analysts and database administrators tend to think of the database more or less in its entirety. They kind of see the big picture, the whole grand scheme of things. Their view extends beyond that of a single application. And again, the perception is based on the business data content. Hence, it's also logical. So again, this is basically the accumulation of everything. So it's a global view, but it's also logical in nature. The systems programmer may be removed from the business data, more focused on the hardware and the operating system files that actually serve to store the actual data. So their interest is going to be more focused on how data are stored rather than on what data are stored. So they have a very different view of the database. They don't look at it from the business kind of functional perspective. So theirs is strictly a physical view looking at how things are represented, not what is represented. An organization may derive a number of benefits from using a database system to store and manage the data. We're going to take a look at a number of these. It's by no means an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of kind of the selling point of a database. And we're going to utilize what we just discussed in terms of the three schema architecture to relate some of these benefits to that organization of, of the data or that perception of the data. The first thing we look at is what is referred to as data independence. The data description is not part of the application program. Recall that we looked at the evolution of the database technology, and we saw that originally the application program was written such that it was tightly bound or tightly associated with the physical structure of the data. The description of the data was embedded within the program. We moved that out to the DBMS, making the program such that it no longer relied on that. So this simplifies the programming effort because we refer to the data effectively by its name. We don't have to get down into low-level commands within the application and actually look at the data from a different perspective. And this is also another aspect of the three schema architecture. What we see is the idea that you've got the logical view is clearly separated from the physical view. Remember, both the local view and the global view, those two views were considered logical. They were looking at data content. Effectively, that's the view of the application program. The physical detail, the lower level, that ends up down here. That's kind of been entrusted to the DBMS as to where the data resides, how it's physically arranged, and so forth. So we've separated the two. And that's one of the benefits that we see to that three schema architecture. And that's a real selling point of database in general is data independence. Another important concept is data integrity. Uh, obviously, I use the word important a lot because I, I perceive many of these things as being important. But here's one where perhaps we can't uh, st stress that word uh, I I enough when we're ta talking about the data we've entrusted to the database. Remember, the data that we've given to the database reflects a representation of some real-world objects. And what we want to do is we want to ensure that business rules that exist within the world are enforced in our representation of the world within the database. And that's where we're looking at ensuring that the data that put into the database is indeed complying with the behavior of the world that we're trying to represent. That could be considered data integrity. So one of the things we talk about is storing a data item in just one location. See, a data item is effectively a fact, and we want to record facts, not multiple times, but record each fact one time. And there's a good reason for that, as we'll talk about in, in a moment. So we want to avoid redu redundant updates. See, each fact, if we store it one time, then should that fact need to be modified in some way, then we modify it once. But if it's stored multiple times and we find 
one instance of it and modify that one instance, someone else comes along and uses that fact to make a business decision, depends on which version they get. Do they get the one we modified, which is up to date and reflective of the real world? Or do they get the one that we neglected to modify, which is kind of outdated now? So by having redundant data, we have to update it in multiple places, redundant updates. But if we store each fact only once, then the idea is it needs to be updated only once. So the re result is this will improve the consistency of the data and the reports or queries that are subjected to that data to make business decisions. We also save on external storage by not having to store the same fact multiple times. And again, the overall idea is improved data quality. Now, we also talk about this concept of what's called integrated data. These are said to be scrubbed and cleansed. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you're taking data from multiple sources and bringing those things together, what happens is you might have in an academic setting someone called an advisor. That advisor is a faculty member, but we may simply call them advisor. In another role, that same individual is referred to as an instructor. In yet another role, that same individual might be the department chair. And one other perspective, simply an employee. All these different names may focus in on the same individual. We have to recognize that that is indeed one individual that we're talking about. If we're talking about the, the individual named Mo, and Mo is an advisor to a number of students, and Mo is a faculty member, and Mo is also an instructor who teaches. Mo is a faculty member. Mo chairs the department. Mo is a faculty member. The idea is that we may not see Mo as faculty in all cases because he's given different titles based upon the job being performed. This goes back to that three schema architecture, the local views. One view where Mo appears is playing the role of advising students. Another view where Mo appears is teaching classes, and another view is chairing a department. We have to recognize that these different terms really refer to the same individual, say single entity of, of a faculty member. So this is part of understanding what's called the data semantics, and this can sometimes be difficult, but when we're taking data from different sources and combining it, we've got to recognize that this thing over here called one thing is the same as this other thing that we've labeled with a different name. And that's where we talk about scrubbing and cleansing the data as we bring it in to, to make sure that everything uh, kind of aligns properly. Maybe another explanation would be helpful here and appreciative. So a consequence of capturing relationships within the database, which is kind of related to the data integrity, is that data are not stored redundantly within a system. So consider data that the Department of Motor Vehicles stores. So you go to the Motor Vehicle Registry or the Department of Motor Vehicles. They have license system, and the license system stores information about driver's licenses. They have a registration system, records information about vehicles and how they're registered to owners. A title system, which also uh, is talking about uh, ve vehicle and vehicle ownership. <coughs> Excuse me. So suppose you have a driver's license. You also have a vehicle registered in your name, and you also own a vehicle. How many times should your name and address appear within the database? It's the same individual performing these different tasks or, or, or different roles effectively. So if the data are stored redundantly, what happens if it has to be updated in some way uh, and, and is updated in only some of the locations? Say they only update your name and address in the license system, but you're still the same person who has the vehicle registered to them and still the same person who owns the vehicle. But we didn't change your, your name and address information there. So if the data are stored redundantly, uh, it's for some express purpose uh, that will benefit from this redundancy. We want to do it in a controlled manner. 
We don't want to just say, oh, it's, it's very easy to store this fact and then store this other fact, even though it's duplicating. We want to make sure that if we do that, there's a real good reason for doing that. And then we can control the updates uh, so that we, we don't have the data inconsistencies. So another key point for a benefit of a database is security and privacy. Remember that the DBMS is the only way through which we can get to the data. The application program cannot go out to the data directly, but the request is issued to the DBMS, which communicates through the operating system with the storage device, gets the data, brings it back into the memory for the DBMS. The DBMS can then relay that to the application. Now, what happens <coughs> as shown in this diagram is pretty interesting. Because suppose what you're doing is you're reading only a subset of the data, like the name and the address. You're not reading the employee number. You're not reading the medical information. When we talk about security and privacy, maybe the medical information is not something that you, whoever you are, making this request should be permitted to see. Yeah, it's okay for you to look at the name of the person and their address, but the medical information is considered very uh, private and we want to protect that. So what we do is with permission control within a database, what we can do is we can give you access to only what you should be permitted to see and exclude other data items from your view. And that's the idea of what being illustrated here. The medical information clearly is in the database. It's brought into the DBMS but it's not exposed to this particular application or this particular user. This again is the notion of say the local view, this particular user is permitted to see only a subset of the data. So local view versus global view. So those concepts that we presented in the three schema architecture are being utilized here to give you an explanation of some of the benefits that you can derive from having a database management system. Now, to be fair, we want to mention that, yeah, there are benefits, but there could also be some negative views in terms of using a database. That is, if you've never had a database before and an organization is making a decision to say, let's develop a database because of all of these benefits that we get, let's consider the potential downside or disadvantages of doing so. One thing is when we're designing an application, we do analysis and design, and we come up with what should be an application, what should it do, how should it behave, and so forth. Well, this process now gets extended when we go to design the database. So analysis and design itself can be very complicated when you have a large number of possible relationships. Each one of these dots in my diagram might represent some kind of an object or entity type. And what we're doing is by connecting them, we're saying, well, it's possible that this thing over here relates to this thing. And then this thing relates to this thing. And the idea is the more entities, the more objects that you have out there, the more potential relationships that exist, hence the more complexity that could possibly manifest itself within and understand or trying to achieve an understanding of, of the organization. So it increases the difficulty perhaps in getting a firm grasp of things like data semantics and what are the objects that are relevant and how do they relate and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's kind of a negative aspect. But on the other hand, it's actually positive to do this because acquiring an understanding of the application domain gives you a much better understanding of the overall operation of the, the organization, excuse me, of, of the organization. Now, here's one of the challenges. Suppose we've got two individuals out there and you may perhaps be the business expert or the domain expert, and you communicate to the data analyst or the database uh, designer, you're saying, I'm talking about polygon. And you have an image in your mind, perhaps, of like a square. And the analyst over here says, aha, polygon, I got it. And the image perceived by this individual is a triangle. We didn't quite convey the same information. so. One of the challenges that we're faced with here is clearly understanding the details of the real world, what we're calling the data semantics in terms of what are the objects, how are they related, and the cardinality of relationships and all that neat stuff that we've been talking about. That has to somehow be transferred 
from the mind and the knowledge realm of the domain expert to the mind and the knowledge realm of the person who is designing and subsequently implementing the database. So the process uh, requires that we somehow come up with an illustration to get the point across. We just can't say, aha, I got it, but we want to ma make sure that we did get it correctly in confirmation. So that's not really so much a negative because again, it comes up with clarification of an understanding of the application domain. And in my experience, I've actually seen that some people who are considered domain experts or knowledge experts don't quite have a 100% handle or grasp on the way their world operates. I've actually revealed to them some differences in terms of their understanding versus reality, because I don't always talk to just one individual. And when you design a database, it's good to talk to multiple individuals, get different perspectives. Again, it goes back to kind of the three schema architecture, where we say when we look at the local views, we're taking the view of one individual for one particular task or function that might be performed. And the database is constructed such that it's going to support many individuals and allow for many different tasks or functions to be accomplished. So to succeed, we have to basically transfer that knowledge. That can be fun, but it requires a different skill set. You may be very technically competent. This requires people skills. Another aspect, which I probably is eternal, this is not going to go away. It's effectively human nature. Uh, what we see is that there can be an organizational impact. If you're dealing currently with, say, data entrusted to operating system files, and you're making a transition to a database, what you're going to see is some folks are going to have, say, custody or control over some particular existing system and the data. And whenever someone in the organization needs an answer, they must come to that individual. So the point is, this is a concept of knowledge being perceived as power. I know how this thing works. I know the nuts and bolts. You want an answer, you come to me. And, you know, I'm sitting up on that pedestal. You, know, you kind of bow before me before you ask the question. Well, that can cause some ripples or waves within an organization when suddenly you say, well, I got to get all of this data, I got to get all of this information, and I'm putting it into a central repository, a database, and then it becomes available to the mass, <coughs> excuse me, to the masses. Everyone can gain access to it without the need to approach this individual. So again, there can be resistance to the change of developing a database. And that's something that's, I mean, you can take other classes in that, like in psychology, or, for example. But it's a fact that we just have to be aware of when we're trying to work with technology. Operational costs. We've already mentioned that the database management system is an additional piece of software. And this piece of software sits effectively between the application program and the data that we wish to uh, access and manipulate in some way. So with that in mind, you may need a bigger processor, a bigger machine. You may need more memory. You might not be able to put the database on your current server. So it might require hardware upgrades and might need something faster as well. So the database itself also has to be maintained. This is something we'll, we'll address down the road in future lectures. We'll talk about the concept of database reorgs, where you have to reorganize the data. For example, if you've taken a data structures course, then you recognize that things like a B tree uh, or binary tree, let's go to a binary tree. A binary tree, if you simply do a bunch of inserts and the values all happen to be kind of in sequential order, you end up degrading into a linear structure, a linked list. So what would happen is at some point you want to kind of rebalance the tree. And this is where things like AVL or HB1 trees come into play uh, because there's a height balance difference between the left and the right subtrees of only one. If you've never taken data structures, just kind of make a note of that, that the database has to be periodic, periodically reorganized. If you've taken data structures, hopefully what I've just said uh, registers with you uh, and it's that aha effect. Um, makes great sense. Yeah, I see what you're talking about. Another potential concern uh, is risk. The idea is that you put all your data in one place. The idea is you're putting all your eggs in one basket. What happens if you drop the basket? 
that's not good for those eggs. It's not good for you. So the idea is that the database needs to be maintained in terms of being reorganized, but it also needs to be maintained in terms of being backed up, backed up and preserved so we have a copy of it somewhere. And then in the event that we drop our basket, we can restore the database and then rec subsequently recover from whatever that problem or failure was. So that's one concern. But database administrators have a responsibility of implementing backup and recovery scenarios. And as long as we implement that strategy, what happens is we should be okay. Now, that's the element of risk. But tied to that is, of course, the element of overhead or cost, because now we need a database administrator, someone who's technically competent in working with this particular DBMS and knows how to do backup and recovery and so forth, and does this on a regular basis to back up the data and recover, of course, if we need to. Another possible concern would be a vendor-related uh, issue. Suppose you say, well, I'm interested in uh, Digital Electronic Corporation, DEC. Uh, DEC had computers, and they also had a relational database called RDB, which was actually a pretty nice system. Uh, suppose you say, well, we're going to go with DEC RDB, and what we're going to do, is that's going to be our relational database. I don't believe DEC, or Digital Electronics Corporation, is in business anymore. In fact, RDB was actually purchased uh, or acquired by Oracle Corporation. So it's kind of interesting if you say, well, we're locked into this particular company. So we're, let's say we're locked into Microsoft, and Microsoft has SQL Server. Well, chances are pretty good Microsoft's not going to go out of business. But Microsoft could drop support for SQL Server. That, that's probably not very likely either. But that's just a for instance to get an idea. So keep that point in mind as another potential concern. You can see that the risks or elements that I've raised here that might be considered disadvantages are not really that serious uh, in that there seem to be, say, workarounds uh, or the, the planning of going to a database kind of addresses these. But to be fair, I did want to bring some of these to the surface for consideration. So the focus of our investigation in the course, remember this is the first topic in a series of lectures and a series of topics uh, to present a full semester course in Introduction to Database. So the, what's the focus of our investigation? The database management system adopts a particular data model, and by that we meant hierarchic, network, relational, uh, but has to deal with additional aspects beyond that logical organization and presentation of the data. Concurrency, recovery, integrity, security. We've addressed a number of these as points or concerns or areas of interest or focus within a study of database. We'll talk about these in detail in later lectures. So the course that we're presenting will address issues related to database management systems in general, and we're going to be using the relational model and relational products to illustrate our concepts, because these you saw from the evolution section on the timeline are still uh, in vogue, they're still in use. They're not legacy systems. A major concern of the course is also where does an actual database come from? Not where the, the DBMS come from, not, not the evolution of the technology, but where does a database come from? We'll discuss data modeling, and we'll also discuss using the database. We'll have sec sections on writing SQL to interact with the database, and we'll talk about that in some detail. I've already posted a number of videos if you're, if you're anxious and can't wait to see those. Now, so by developing an understanding of relational database, you'll achieve a solid foundation, hopefully overall, in the field of database itself, not just looking at a particular product, but overall, what is a database? How does it work? How do I work, work with it? So in summary, what, what is it that we've talked about? We provided an introduction to database systems. We defined many terms that apply to database systems. And brace yourself, there will be more terms as we continue our investigation. We presented key characteristics of database. We explained how a database is more than merely a collection of files, but we've captured relationships. We discussed the concept of the three schema architecture and explained how that's relevant to a database system. 
We distinguish between different types of data management, such as operational and informational, and we explain roles of various individuals who might work within an organization dealing with database. So hopefully uh, you found this useful. Uh, if you have any suggestions or comments, please include those in the comments section uh, as you viewed the video. And consider subscribing to the channel so you can be made aware as to when additional videos have been posted. Uh, subscribing is free and it's going to help I'll let you know when, when uh, we posted video. And that's pretty much it. So thanks for watching.